Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from the break. My name is Katherine Tyner, and I'll be starting off session four by giving a talk on the history and the rationale behind our recommendations for in vitro feeding tube testing of drug products being delivered through enteric feeding tubes. I'll be followed by my colleague, Dr. Mamta Kapoor, who will be discussing some case studies on these in vitro testing of feeding tubes. And we'll finalize session four by having a talk by my colleague, Dr. Ming-Li Chui, on locally acting GI drug products. So I'll start by talking about the history of enteric feeding tubes, as well as some of the laboratory testing that went into our understanding of the risks of forming clogs when administering drug products through feeding tubes. Although we then go into a list of some of the in vitro testing recommendations that we have developed. And finally, I'll talk about applying those lessons learned um, to a specific product and the product specific guidance, specifically the Lenzoprazole orally disintegrating tablets. So first, a history of enteral feeding tubes, which I'll now call feeding tubes for the rest of the talk. Feeding tubes are medical devices, and they're used to allow for the delivery of food and medicine, and for this talk, we'll be focusing on the medicine, for patients who are unable to swallow oral dosage forms for a variety of medical reasons. There are many types of classes of feeding tubes, and they're based upon where the tube enters the body, as well as where it ends in the GI tract. In addition, there are a wide variety of tubing within those classes, and that can vary by the size of the tubing, what the tube is made out of, the tube geometry, the ports and the connectors, and on and on. So a couple of things to remember as we go through this talk on feeding tubes. The first, again, being the diversity of the feeding tubes, both by class as well as the different types of configurations within the class. And the reason why you'd have this diversity is due to the size of patients, the type of food, the type of medical um, reason for the tube, and what have you. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of the distal end of an NG feeding tube. It has two eyes. These are the outlet ports to allow for free flow of medicine, and a closed, that means sealed off, distal tip of the tube. The other thing to keep in mind is talking about when we're talking about the size of the feeding tubes, we're talking about French units. One French unit is equal to 0.33 millimeters. And this talks about the outer diameter of the feeding tube. And that's another key component we'll be talking about as we look at the risk of clogging of these tubes. Now that inner diameter can change for a variety of reasons. Um, some being just the manufacturing of the tube, the type of material that's being used to manufacture the tube, um, as well as other things that can be in that inner volume of that tube um, that could impede the flow of medicine and delivery of the medicine. So on the bottom, we have a picture of a G tube with a balloon. These balloons are used to help anchor the tubes into the patient. And what you can see on the blown up portion of it is that when the feeding tube balloon is inflated, it essentially halves the internal volume um, where the medicine or the food is allowed to go through. So these are, again, key components that we're going to be looking at when we're looking at the risk of forming clogs for feeding tubes. So there are reasons and reasons why we're looking for the risk of forming clogs for drug products that are being administered through feeding tubes. Clinical data suggests that feeding tube occlusions or full clogs occur between 25 to 35% during just routine use. And these clogs can form under a variety of conditions, some of those being, but not limited to, whether or not you have insoluble material, uh, whether or not that insoluble material is sticky, whether or not it aggregates to itself, whether or not it, it, it forms adhesions to the tubing material, um, the size of the insoluble material, and others. There are two main reasons why we as an agency are concerned about the potential for clogging or material buildup for products administered via feeding tubes. The first one being that if you have a clog or if you have an occlusion, you could have incomplete delivery of the medicine. The other being if you have a full clog can sometimes cause the patient to have to have 
the two being removed and replaced. And there's multiple examples of this within the literature as well as the clinic. We have a picture in the middle. This is from one of our pictures from our laboratory studies in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality at FDA. You can see it's an NG tube that has an occlusion in the, the tubing portion, as well as a full clog in the inlet port. So as I alluded to in the previous slide, the FDA has performed laboratory studies to assess the risk of various conditions on the delivery of drug products via these feeding tubes. And this work was done within the Office of Testing and Research, within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality here at FDA. I have at the bottom a link to one of the publications from this work. And this work really looked at a variety of conditions and a variety of tests that can be used to assess the risk of clogging of these feeding tubes. There were a couple of key findings from these studies. The first being that the design of the feeding tube, specifically the size of that internal diameter, really affects the risk of tube obstruction. So this would be the size of that internal diameter, as well as if there was a gastric balloon which has that internal volume. In addition, the size and location of the tube openings, as well as if you have an open and closed distal tip, also impacted how likely you were to form tube clogs or occlusions. Interestingly, the length of the tubing did not have an effect on the risk of clogging. Another key finding was that rinsing and flushing step of the tube after administration of the drug product was critical to fully administer the dose. Based on our studies and experience, the FDA has developed recommendations for using in vitro testing to assess the risk of clogging for drug products administered through feeding tubes. And we look at both the quality as well as the bioequivalence for generic. For quality, we're gonna be looking at the recovery testing, how much of the drug you've administered through the top of the tube comes down through the end of the tube under a variety of conditions. And these conditions are going to be the in-use conditions that you're gonna see in the product label. So that would be a holding time. If it says that you can have the, the preparation of the material for a certain amount of time, that would be the hold time. Repeat administration, so that's if the drug product is administered multiple times throughout the day, as well as looking at sedimentation, volume, and redispersibility testing. This is a very much a visual test where you can see whether or not the sedimentation of the insolubles is sedimenting, such as you can see on the right, or also floating throughout the dispersion, as also can be indicated by the figure on the right. For bioequivalence, you're looking at the test product versus the reference product, and that would also involve recovery testing, typically 12 units, as well as a particle size distribution study. If you have enterically coated granules, then acid resistance would also be put into play. Key caveat here, is when we are talking about the in vitro testing recommendations, we are excluding oral solutions because oral solutions present a very low risk for forming clogs or occlusions because you have no solid to do so. So when we're talking about the in vitro testing recommendations, we are talking about ones that have either insoluble recipients or insoluble API. Now, when we talk about the considerations when developing those in vitro tests, we're talking about which class of tubing you're using whether it be NG, G, or what have you, how that drug product is prepared for administration through the tubing. And all of this you can be found based upon the proposed administration that is typically found in the package insert of the drug product. So let's go ahead and look at a case study and work through how we would look at the risk as well as the different testing conditions that would, we would use for a feeding tube study. And for this case study, we'll look at Lanzoprazole delayed release orally disintegrated tablets. Now I've copied a bit from the product insert um, for the administration of this product um, through NG tubes. And so you can see that it says that the product can be administered through a nasogastric tube um, with a French diameter of eight or greater. It also goes on to talk about the administration conditions, such as how the tablet is dispersed in a solution, in this case, water. 
um, how it's uh, shaken gently to allow for a quick dispersal, and that the product can be held up to 15 minutes, that would be the whole time, before injecting the dispersion through an esogastric tube. Then comes the very important flush step of refilling the syringe with, again, water, shaking and getting the rest of that dispersion through the nasogastric tube. And one thing I want to point out before we go into kind of the, the thought behind how we would assess the risk and the testing that is um, requested, what I would like to point out is that for the majority of products that have enteric feeding tube indications, you will be able to find some recommendations on the testing considerations in the product specific guidances. And this is one of the examples for Lanzoprazole. But if you do have a specific product that you're looking at, please do go to the product specific guidance webpage and see if it has a specific section on, on the feeding tube testing. In most cases, you will find that. All right, so let's walk through what we're looking at when we're doing that risk assessment and looking at what we would want to look at for the potential of this product to clog during administration through a feeding tube. So first thing we're gonna be looking at is the formulation. So it's an orally disintegrating tablet. That means it has insoluble excipients within it. Um, it's delayed release. It has delayed release microgranules. These will be enterically coated. This will be important when we start thinking about the pH of the media, especially the water, that the product will be dispersed in prior to administration through that tube. And then granules. So we have microgranules. There are large particle size. You can see them by eye. So that would be another risk factor to consider in the formulation. Then we go ahead and look at the conditions of use. So in the product label, it says that the product will be dispersed. You'll disperse the tablet in water and then administered through a nasogastric tube, French eight or larger, so that gives us the minimum size that we'd be looking at within 15 minutes. And again, that 15 minutes would be the maximum holding time that we'd be looking at when we're starting to think about the in vitro testing. The tube is flushed with water after administration and not in this portion of the label, but, but in the administration portion, it is noted that you can administer this product up to three times daily. Okay. So now let's look at the risk. So we have risk of agglomeration and potential clogging risk of those insoluble excipients. If you have something solid in there, it is something that is potential. We also have that enteric coating of the microgranules. And if you have coating degradation, it can get sticky. Um, you can have early release of the medication. And this would be another risk that we'd be looking at. And finally, you'd have the large granule size itself, which again would be a clogging risk. So when we start thinking about what type of testing we want to see, we would want to see percent recovery. We want to see that for, for all of the different testing. And you want to see it with multiple tube consider configurations, but at the minimum size, which would be French 8 for an NG tube. So we'd want to be looking at sedimentation studies to see how those microgranules behaved when they were dispersed in the syringe. Because the product can be administered up to three times daily, we would want to look at repeat administration, which means that you would run the recovery test three times in a row on the same tube. We would do hold time, which again was stated in the label as up to 15 minutes, and we would do it in various type pHs, and that varying pH is due to that enterically coated microgranule. So making sure that depending on what type of water you get, and tap water can range in various pHs throughout the country, uh, making sure that that is not going to impact that recovery. You'd also be doing a particle size distribution study and acid resistance study for the bioequivalence considerations. So in summary, we use in vitro testing to help demonstrate the low risk of a formulation forming clogs when delivered through a feeding tube. There's a variety of in vitro tests that can be performed uh, to demonstrate this low risk, and that's based upon the formulation and the conditions of use of that drug product. And finally, as a reminder, there are product-specific guidances available, um, many of them that have indications for administration through feeding tubes
will contain the agency's recommendations on those types of in future tests we would like to see. All right, on to the challenge questions. Question one, yes or no, oral solutions are considered to be high risk for clogging and tarot feeding tubes. And the answer is no. If it is solution, we consider that a low risk to form clogs within those feeding tubes. Question number two. Name two different design characteristics of enteral feeding tubes that impact the risk for obstruction. All right, there are quite a few. And so if you had two of these, you have completed your challenge questions and things such as the tube type, the diameter, especially that inner diameter, the tube composition, the tube geometry, port number, and connection type. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues and fellow session speakers for their comments and consideration in forming this talk, as well as the laboratory personnel in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Office of Testing and Research, who provided us that invaluable research to help us understand the risks and the testing considerations for feeding tubes. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I will pass the floor on to my colleague, Dr. Mamta Kapoor, who will present more in-depth case studies on these feeding tube tests.